but, but there's a number of us, there's a few of us out there who have really dug into the Old Testament. And so um, when Mark asked me to do the Old Testament, I'm doing just uh, two days on it. So it's going to be a whirlwind tour. We're going to cover the whole New Testament or the whole Old Testament in two days. No, not really. It's not possible, right? So the way I carved this up is we're just going to look at just a little piece. Uh, today we're going to take the big picture. What is the Old Testament? How does that fit in with the, with the New Testament? And then in two weeks from now, we're going to dig in uh, to look at a couple characters in the Old Testament. Right. So today is the big view, what some people say is the 30,000 foot view of the Old Testament. Um, and I have a couple goals, a couple things I'm hoping that um, you all get out of it. One is that you'll be inspired to study the Old Testament. If you haven't already, some of us are really digging into it, and that's great. Some of us maybe not so much. And so I'm hoping that this study will inspire you to study a little bit more. Also, I'd like you to understand the connection between the Old and the New Covenant. There is a connection between those two. And last, this is my secret goal, because you're saying, okay, well, how does that fit in with the Old Testament? Is to understand the importance of the Holy Spirit. And so you'll see a little bit more of that as we're going through this. But those are my goals for today. Um... Why do we even study the Old Testament, right? Isn't the most important stuff in the New Testament? Well, they kind of build on each other. And in fact, there's a couple books. In fact, there's a book study that's going on before church. And they are studying out N.T. Wright's Simply Good News. There's a lot of other books that go along with, with that. One of them is called The King Jesus Gospel. And in all of these books... What the author is trying to get across is that you don't really understand the New Testament unless you understand the Old Testament. In fact, you don't understand the gospel of Jesus Christ unless you understand the Old Testament. They go hand in hand. It's one big picture of God's intervention in the world, God's creation and his working in the world, and they all go together. So, and, and so in this one, the King Jesus gospel, and those of you who come on, uh, on uh, Sunday morning, um, with uh, Greg Moots and Kevin Grady, they're taking you through that book study, are going to be talking about what is the gospel, and the gospel is everything. It's the Old Testament and the New Testament. In fact, in this book right here, he makes the claim that Paul's gospel, better yet, the early Christian gospel, is rooted in the Old Testament scriptures. And he goes on to say that on page 50 of this book right here, that Paul explicitly cites the Old Testament more than 100 times, and the number of implicit allusions and echoes in his letters boggles the mind. Basically what he's saying is, if you want to understand what Paul is saying, he wrote the majority of the New Testament. If you want to understand what he's saying, you have to understand what the Old Testament says. We're just gonna, I'm going to go over just one example, just to kind of talk about that a little bit. So the big idea, the New Testament really only makes sense when we understand the Old Testament and Israel's history. So I'm going to just take one scripture. We're going to look at this scripture. Paul, in this section of, uh, in, of his letter in 2 Corinthians, of his letter to the church in Corinth, never explicitly says this is from an Old Testament scripture. Yet when you start looking at it, I don't think you can really understand the fullness of what Paul is saying without understanding the illusions that he's making, the things he's saying, and it's coming because Paul was steeped in Old Testament. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. That's what he did. He studied the Old Testament, right? He knew it. He didn't say anything without having that as the bedrock or as the background or the foundation of what he believed and what he understood. So everything Paul said came from that. So we're just going to look at one section of scripture and we're going to kind of kind of flesh out, okay, what was Paul's understanding just a little bit and how does that help us to understand what he was writing to the church in Corinth? So I'm just going to go ahead and read. You can follow along or you can look it up in your, in your own Bible. But Paul writes, he has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? And then skipping down to verse 18. 
And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. That's a lot to wrap your head around, right? That's a lot to comprehend. And when I was, when I was saying this, you might have been, you know, like, wow, I, I don't even know what Paul's talking about. And some of you might be right on, you're like, oh, I understand everything that Paul was talking about. Let's take it verse by verse, just to see how our understanding of the Old Testament helps us to understand this. Let's look at the first one. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant. Obviously, there has to be another covenant. If there's a new covenant, there had to be an old covenant, right? right? And in fact, there were many covenants. So a covenant is just a legal contract, right? So when God made a covenant with Abraham, he actually made a legal contract with Abraham. They call, and they call that the Abrahamic covenant. Noah was the same way. God made a covenant with Noah. That's what the rainbow is all about, right? That's God's symbol, uh, sign of that covenant, that he was never going to flood the earth again. That was a covenant or a legal contract, right? And it happens throughout the Bible over and over and over again. Moses, when he came down from uh, Mount Sinai, Sinai with the Ten Commandments, that was a contract or a legal document, right? That was a covenant between the people of Israel and God. So what is a covenant? It's the same thing as a testament. When you read the Old Testament, we can call that God's legal contract with his people from the Old Testament. When we read the New, New Testament or the New Covenant, that is God's legal contract with the people now, the New Covenant people, right? So covenant, testament, both words, they mean legal contract. So it is a contract, right? So we're trying to get that. So what Paul says is he has made, it's not about God. God has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant. There was an old covenant. Now there's a new covenant. Not the letter of the, not the letter, but the spirit for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. So does that mean a W slays me? Like a W comes in, like there's a letter. That's all. No. No, what he's, so let's, let's look into this just a little bit. What does that mean? Not the letter, but the spirit. Okay, so you have to know what covenant he's, is he talking about. So this old covenant, because I said there were several covenants. The covenant he's actually talking about here is the covenant with Moses. That when Moses brought down the Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai. And, we're gonna, and you're going to say, well, how do you know that? How do you know it wasn't one of the other covenants? We're going to look at that in just a minute. But the covenant he's talking about... The legal contract that he's talking about is this Ten Commandments, mm -hmm. right? And he says, not the letter, but the Spirit. So the letter means, and you guys have read this, right? You read, you know, and it's all through Hebrews. So if you ever read Hebrews, it talks about this covenant where God says, you obey me in these Ten Commandments, and I'm going to bless you. I'm going to show you favor, right? I'm going to, so your part is to not worship false gods. Your part is to obey these Ten Commandments. My part is I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless your offspring. I'm going to bless your flocks and goats. I'm going to bless your fields, your crops. I'm going to bless all of that, right? So that was that covenant that he was setting up. Now, how does that kill? Not the letter, but the spirit for the letter kills. How did that letter kill? Well, were the Israelites ever able to fulfill the Ten Commandments? No. If you read through it, they were never able to. And we're not talking about spiritual death. We're talking about physical death. Both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom were taken into captivity. But I'm going to talk about that just in a little bit. Basically, majority of the Israelites, lots of them died. Right? Lots of them died. We're talking about physical death. Right? Not spiritual death. Okay? And that's what he's talking about here. He's like, we can never obey the Ten Commandments. Paul, uh, Paul says this over and over in his scripture. He's like, why do you, the Galatian church, you know, the church in Galatia, why do you want to go back to that? We could never obey in the first place. My forefathers never could obey it. Why do you want to go back to that? Okay, so he's talking about the covenant, the Ten Commandments. He says, not of the letter, but the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. That is the piece that we want to dig into. The Spirit gives life. What Spirit is he talking about? The New Covenant is the Holy Spirit. I'm going to talk about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is pivotal with the new covenant. So let's let's look. But you know what? God told the Israelites this a long time ago. He told them that from the beginning. In fact, we're going to look at Jeremiah. So Jeremiah 
was around probably about 600 years before Jesus was born, right? So that's when he was, you know, five or 600 years before um, uh, Jesus was even around. And God spoke through Jeremiah, who was a prophet. And there's a book called the Book of Jeremiah. And in it, he says, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel. So the people of Israel are like a new covenant. We have, we have the covenant. We have the Ten Commandments. We, we had that, we've had that ever since Moses brought it to us. He says, when I will make a new covenant, and that's what we're talking about right here, this new covenant, with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. There was Israel and Judah. At one point, there was one kingdom. Rehoboam, which was one of the kings, was not a real good king, and he caused a split. So the northern kingdom, often referred to as the kingdom of Israel, kind of went off and did their own thing. The southern kingdom was the kingdom of Judah. I know there's a lot to wrap around if you haven't really dug into this. We're going to talk more about this uh, next week a little bit too. But for right now, the main, the main thing I will point out is that when he's talking about Israel and Judah, he's just talking about all of his people. He's saying everybody. All of the people. All of Jacob's children. Right? He's talking about everybody. So he says, I will make a new covenant with, I'm just going to insert in here, all of my people. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. Because remember, God, there was the ten plagues, Pharaoh, Pharaoh didn't want to let his people go. Finally, Pharaoh let his people go. They came out, what did they, they were in the desert. Moses went up to Mount Sinai. He came down with the Ten Commandments. That's what we're talking about right here. He says, God says, I led them out of Egypt. But he says, this new covenant is not going to be like the old one. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors because I, when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. So he's saying that the old covenant, they broke. So the new covenant is going to be different. It's not going to be like that. Okay, let's dig in just a little bit more. And, and by the way, I will tell you that Jeremiah, this passage right here, Jeremiah 31 Chapter 31, 31 through 34 is the longest Old Testament passage quoted in the New Testament. So the Old Testament writers, and they brought this up over, it's significant. I guess that's my point. It was brought up over and over and over again. Not only in Hebrews, but we're learning this is exactly what Paul was referencing. So how do we know which covenant it was? Was it actually Moses? Moses' covenant from the Ten Commandments? Well, let's look right here. In Exodus 34, 29, says, Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands. Okay? And also in Deuteronomy 11, 13 through 21. So if you faithfully obey the commands I give you, that I'm giving you today, to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, then I will send rain on your land in its season, both autumn and spring rains, so that you may gather in your grain new wine and olive oil. I will provide grass in the fields for your cattle, and you will eat and be satisfied. Basically, I'm going to just say, this is what God was saying. He's saying, this is my contract with you. You do this, I do this. It's not really, these are like the Ten Commandments. You can see the writing's not the same on, on, on both of them. But um, God had his part. Man had his part. Man's part was to obey the Ten Commandments. God's part was to show them favor. What was this idea of favor? This favor was, I'm going to send rain on your land in season so your crops will grow. Both autumn and spring rains. So that, may you get, that you can gather in the grain. I'm going to give you wine, olive oil. I'm going to provide grass in the fields for your cattle. I'm going to take care of you. God says, worship me. Don't worship other gods. Right? So there was a contract right here. Now, those of you who have read the Old Testament, how did the Israelites do with that? How did they do with obeying their part of the bargain? They didn't do so hot, right? Some of them did. A lot of them didn't. Probably the vast majority of them didn't. So let's go back to Paul's writing. In verse 7, it says, Now, if the ministry that brought death, what was that ministry that brought death? That's the Old Covenant. That's the ministry that brought death. Let me just show you this. This is why he's calling that the ministry that brought death. Here's, here's the timeline. This is just a timeline so you'll have 
copies of this timeline. I made a copy of you for each person. There's lots of them, so everybody can have their own. So you had Israel and you had Judah. Let me just show you something. When the Israelites first came into the promised land, each tribe got their own land, right? But then Rehoboam kind of messed up and you had a division. You had Israel, which was composed of the majority of the tribes up here. And then you had Judah, which was mainly Judah, Simeon, Benjamin, some of the others, because you did have some godly people that were up here and they migrated down. And you also had the priests, a lot of the priests, the Levites, came down in here. But you had two kingdoms, okay? Israel and Judah. Now this timeline, that's why this timeline's broken up like this. Israel had its own set of kings. Judah had its own set of kings. I will tell you, Israel basically never had a good king. But look at God's patience. I just wanna show you something. So here's David, you guys know about David, King David, and you know about his son, King Solomon. And then you see Solomon's son, Rehoboam right here, he's the one who messed up and caused the division of the two kingdoms. And so you had a divided kingdom right here. Then you had all these kings. The Israelites weren't obeying God, they were worshiping false gods, and God said, don't do that. He sent them prophets, and I didn't even put all of them in there. See these prophets right here? Some of them didn't write books, like Elisha, Elijah, Elisha. They didn't write books. There's no book in the Bible that's by them. But when you read the Old Testament, you're going to see that they preached, and they said, you guys need to shape up. And how long do you do it? Hundreds of years. See that timeline? Hundreds of years. God kept saying, you need to follow me. And then they didn't. And he'd send more prophets and more prophets and more prophets and people didn't repent. What happened? This right here, that's when the Northern Kingdom fell. You ever heard about, the, you know, they, they have these sensational movies, The Lost Ten Tribes or whatever, these shows or whatever. That's what they're talking about right here because we don't know where these people went. Assyria, which was the nation, Nineveh, like Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. Well, there was good reason Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh because he knew Nineveh was a threat. And God said, I want even those people to repent. Jonah didn't want to go because this is what happened. Eventually, after hundreds of years of God pleading with his people, saying repent, and then they, did, they just turned their back on God, God caused this country right here to come in and take over the northern kingdom. And they took all those people into exile. They took them into what is now Iraq and Iran. And, we don't, and we, there's no record of them. They just assimilated with those populations, right? We don't even know what happened to them. But that's, that's what happened. That's the ministry of death because those people were unable or unwilling to obey God. Well, do you think there were some really good kings that were trying to help out? What do you guys think about Judah? Was Judah perfect and everything went well for them? No, they lasted a little bit longer. A couple hundred years, if you look at the timeline, a couple hundred years, but eventually what happened to them? They got taken into captivity by Babylon. Right there, there's the fall of Jerusalem, right? They got taken in there for 70 years. They were in exile in Babylon, and then they were repatriated. It means in three successive waves, they were allowed to come back to their homeland. But they were all taken away. They were all taken away, okay? So that's just kind of the big, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this uh, next week. That's just kind of the big picture, but it helps us to understand what we were talking about, the ministry that brought death. That death was because there was the Ten Commandments, the Israelites didn't obey. The result of that, after God pleading, you know, you, the, um, uh, uh, the amazing mercy of God is that he didn't just wipe them out. Yeah. I'm talking hundreds of years. Hundreds of years. You ever heard, you know, like uh, in the King James Version, they, they uh, translate patience. And I like their translation a little bit better. They call it long-suffering. God was long-suffering. Just think how, how long God put up with that. He just suffered. Hundreds of years he suffered and put up with that because of his mercy. And it was only after hundreds of years that he finally said, I told you what was going to happen hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And then it eventually did. That's what Paul is talking about here. The ministry that brought death.
He says, now the ministry that brought death, which was these Ten Commandments right here, which was engraved in letters on stone. So now he's making it really clear. He is talking about Moses' writings, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory. What glory was that? So when Moses, let's look down here, Exodus 34, 29 through 35. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant like he had spoken, because he had spoken with the Lord. So when Moses came down with those, because he was talking with God, his face was glowing. That's the glory he's talking about. His face was shining. It was glowing. So when Paul writes, now the ministry that brought death, he's talking about the Ten Commandments here, which was engraved in letters on stone, it came with glory because Moses' face would shine when he had to re-talk with God. So that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of, face of Moses because of its glory, transitory though it was. He's saying it's transitory because Moses' face didn't glow forever. It stopped glowing over time. Right? Moses would put a veil over his face, and then when the glowing would stop, when it would not be radiant, he would take the veil off. But it would take a little bit of time. And that's what we're talking about right here. Because it was transitory. Here's the key. Will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? This was Paul's plan, or God's plan, from the very beginning. The ministry that we're living in right now is the ministry of the Spirit. The covenant that we're living in right now is the covenant of the Holy Spirit. The old covenant could never save the people because the people could not obey it. The new covenant can be obeyed because God's Spirit lives in you. God gives you the power to obey. That's why we're going to be talking a little bit more about the Holy Spirit. This is the pivotal piece that I want to make a point of right now. Because with this new covenant, the old covenant said, you do your part, I'm going to do my part. You obey my Ten Commandments, you obey my rules, I'm going to bless you. Here's God's new covenant. I'd like you to obey my rules, and I'm going to help you to do that. God does both parts. I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit. I'm going to give you my son, so you're going to be clean and white and pure in my eyes. I'm going to give you his Holy Spirit so that you can know right from wrong, so that you can uh, overcome sin, so that you can become a changed person, so that you can become a new creation, so that you can have victory. The victory comes from the Holy Spirit. And that's what we're talking about here, this new covenant. God did something totally new. He put his spirit in you. That's the victory we're talking about here. And that is powerful. I mean, it's really, really amazing. You know, so in, in the old times, there was a contract. You do your part, I'll do my part. In the new covenant, God says, I'll do my part and I'm going to do your part. I'm going to do both. Which is pretty wild. So, um, this is that division right here. Let's look at what Paul goes on to say in verse 8. Well, not the ministry of the Spirit. So what's he talking about? What ministry is he talking about? Ministry of the Spirit. The New Covenant. That's, that's the, the New Testament. The New Covenant. Right? That's the ministry of the Spirit. Will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? Why was it more glorious? Because God's going to give you the victory. You don't have to do it on your own. He's going to give you the salvation through Jesus' blood. He's going to give you the forgiveness. He's going to give you the ability to say no to sin. He's going to give you the ability to be changed, to be more like Jesus, and it's all through his Holy Spirit. All right. Um, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that brought condemnation, he's still referring to the um, Ten Commandments. If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness, this new covenant? And this was all foretold, not only in one place, I'm just going to show you Jeremiah, but it's talked about, in Ezekiel he talks, talks about taking a heart of stone and making it a heart of flesh. That's not possible by humans. That changing that heart of stone and making it a heart of flesh, a heart that is hard towards God and making it a heart that's soft towards God, that's only possible through the Holy Spirit. Right? And so that's what he's talking about here. So in Jeremiah 31 through 33, 34, this is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write on their hearts. How does he do that? It's the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about things that the Holy Spirit does in just a minute. That comes from the Holy Spirit. 
putting their law in our hearts, putting his law in our hearts, and writing, writing on our hearts, that comes from the Holy Spirit. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. So will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? Let's look at a couple passages in the New Testament that talk about this ministry of the Spirit. These are all Jesus talking. In Luke 22, this is the Last Supper, Jesus breaking that bread, right? And he took the bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant. The new covenant, right? So... At that time, his disciples only knew the old covenant because the new covenant hadn't been instituted yet. He's saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Now let's look in, in John's gospel. In John 14, this is also Jesus talking. He says, if you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. Who's that advocate? It's the Holy Spirit. And he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Some people refer to it as the indwelling Holy Spirit. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. This is pivotal. I think that if we don't understand the Holy Spirit's role in our lives, then we don't really understand the gospel. So let's look at some of these things that the Holy Spirit does. I put them on the back of your, um, we have the Old Testament chronology, and if you flip it over on the back, and you know, I didn't put all the stuff that the Holy Spirit does, and I need to put all the scripture references. I'm hoping that you'll go study that out because this is that important. Um, but we may ask ourselves, this is just my question, because a lot of the stuff I've been digging out for about four months now. It says, how does the ministry of the Spirit, the new covenant, help me? The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. You know, when we study with people, we study the Bible with people, it's the Holy Spirit that convicts them of sin. We do our part. It's the Holy Spirit that convicts them of sin, right? That's John 16, 8, but it's also, and there's other scriptures. The Holy Spirit gives us spiritual life and salvation. So we need the Spirit to be born again. You guys have heard this, these phrases, being born again, or becoming a new creation. You can't do that without the Holy Spirit. If you want to become a new creation, you have to have the Holy Spirit, right? And the Holy Spirit is given at baptism. We need the Holy Spirit to be saved. It talks about that in Titus right here. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not saved. We have to receive the Holy Spirit to enter heaven. You don't got that Holy Spirit, you're not getting into heaven. And there's a, there's a misnomer. They're going to dig this out. I'm on uh, the Holy the whole, heaven is coming to us, right? But I'm not going to talk about that because I don't want to ruin the thunder of the guy's class in the um, uh, Sunday morning class. Um, the Holy Spirit aligns our words and actions so that we please God. You can't please God without the Holy Spirit. You can't align your words and actions to what God wants unless the Holy Spirit is guiding you. The Holy Spirit gives us life and makes us God's children. When you have the Holy Spirit, you're part of God's family. You're God's children. Right? There's a whole bunch of them. We have to have the Holy Spirit to belong to Christ. The Holy Spirit confirms that we are included in Christ. Also, the Holy Spirit makes us more like Jesus. We call that process sanctification. That's the Holy Spirit working in my life and in your life to make you more like Jesus. And there's a whole bunch of scriptures. I didn't put them all up there, but there's a whole bunch of scriptures on that. And that is the Holy Spirit's process to make us more like Jesus. The Holy Spirit is our teacher and he reminds us. He is our comforter and lives in us. He's our guide, and he reveals truth to us. We only understand because the Holy Spirit reveals these things. He gives us victory over sin, 
enables us to love and bear fruit. You know that whole parable of the vine? What is that stain in the vine? The stain in the vine is stain in, in Jesus. That stain in concert with the Holy Spirit. Right? When we're in concert with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is guiding us. Guiding us how we think, what we say, what we do, how we live our life, the faith that we have. When we're in there, then we're in the vine. It's the Holy Spirit. It's like, it's like the nourishing sap. So, so to stay in the vine, you have to stay in tune with the Holy Spirit. Now, you can, you can disregard the Holy Spirit. The Bible calls that grieving the Spirit. But don't grieve the Holy Spirit, right? We don't want to do that. We don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. We want to stay in tune with the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit gives us victory over sin, enables us to love and bear fruit. That's that bearing fruit. And fruit here is just not making disciples. That's right. part of it. Fruit is so much bigger than that. Yeah. You ought to study out what fruit is. Right? Fruit is love. So you read 1 Corinthians 13. That talks about all the attributes of love. Because Paul says, now I'll show you the most excellent way. And he's talking about love. That's huge. So, but the Holy Spirit helps us to love. You ever struggle with some of these things? You ever struggle with loving people? You know, the Holy Spirit helps us in that, right? And he gives us the power to overcome sin in our lives. I, I don't think that it's possible by our own sheer strength to overcome sin, sin in our lives. It's only through God's Holy Spirit that we can overcome the sin in our lives. So, the last one, and I'm going to stop right here. This is the one where, it's, where I was talking about the Holy Spirit makes us more like Jesus. I just want to give you one example right here. Um, oops. So there's two scriptures I'm just going to talk about right here. This is Paul. Paul ends up and he says, and we all who with unveiled faces, remember he's talking about, that's that reference to Moses. Moses got close to God, his face would glow, and so we'd have to cover his face with a veil. And now he's saying that we all, we're close to God, but we don't have to have an, a veiled face. We have unveiled faces. We contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image, into Jesus' image, with ever-increasing glory. What is that ever-increasing glory? You're not going to become like Jesus just in a day, or in a decade, or in two decades. It's ever-increasing. That glory is being more and more like Jesus, more and more loving more and more trusting of God, more and more, and that's that ever-increasing glory. Your glory is being like your dad, being like God, being like God's son Jesus, our Lord and Savior. When we're like Jesus, then we have increasing glory. And guess where it comes from? Which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. It comes from Jesus, who is the Spirit. You know, I will say that this can be a little confusing for people, so if, if some of this seems like it's a little bit overwhelming, I'm encouraging you to go study it out. Um, I'm happy to, you know, help anybody, to study with anybody that's interested. The one thing I want to point out right here is that you hear this word called the Trinity. The Trinity is not found in the Bible, but there's so many scriptures that say um, that Jesus is God. And right here it says... That Jesus is the Spirit. And that's how they get the idea. There's lots of scriptures, and so theologians put those together and say, well, here this is saying that Jesus and God are one. And here it's saying that Jesus and the Holy Spirit are one. And so there's a number of those, and people, that's where they come up with things like, uh, words like the Trinity, because the idea is they're all connected. We don't really understand how they're all connected, but they are connected, and they're one. And this is just one of those examples. Because the Lord is the Spirit. But it was also talked about in the Old Testament. Isaiah. Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are the work of your hands. God is transforming us. And um, I just want to give you one example of this. So, um, before Justin was born, this was like seven, over 17 years ago, we decided that we need an extra bedroom because we wanted our boys to have bedrooms, like have their own bedroom. And so where Sue and I were looking around, we're thinking, do we need to move? And we like our neighbors, and it's expensive to move. We just decided to put an addition on it. I'm telling you, this is something that has only come to my understanding in the last, maybe the last year, no more than that. I prayed about this, that God would understand, help me to understand this over a couple decades ago. 
Sometimes you ask God to help you understand, he will. But sometimes it takes a little time. Yeah. Or he may just say no. That, that's, it's my prerogative. God can say no. You're not, I'm not, you know, it's not for you to know. But in this one, we, we decide to put on an addition in our house. So I paid somebody. The guy came and started building on it, got it all framed in. And then he went out of business. And here's my response. This, this is, you know, like 17 years ago. My response is, God, how can you do this? I thought you loved me. I'm doing my part. How come you're not taking care of me? How come this is going so bad? Because this cost me huge money. I couldn't get anybody to come in and fix it. Right? I had to do it myself. Because nobody wanted to come in and, and fix a project that's half done. Because then they're liable. Right? Like they had it framed in, but there was no window. Rain was coming right into my addition. Snow was coming right into my addition. There was no windows. There was no doors. There was no HVAC. So there was no heating. There's no cool, cooling. There's no electrical. There, there's, the bathroom wasn't done. There was no plumbing. The guy just left. And I'm thinking, seriously? It took me two years with a lot of help from disciples yep. to finish that off. And only recently have I started understanding what that was all about. Before that happened, I asked God, God, help me to know a little bit about maintenance. Help me. We ask, you guys do the same thing, right? God, help, help, help me to know a little bit how to take care of my house, right? And, and God said, okay. Well, see, the problem is, and I, and, I, and I learned a lot of things from two years of working on putting everything in, right? Um, but... That wasn't the point. God was answering my prayer by helping me to know a little bit more about home maintenance, about putting in, you know, HVAC and, you know, air conditioning and heating. And, and I did all the tile work and, you know, I mean, all of that. God's point was, and I'm just now understanding this. You wouldn't have gone through the effort of learning all these things on your own. And that's totally true. It was only through this, what I considered a bad situation that I've learned all of those things. And you know what's really true? God does the same thing with our character. We won't go through that pain of transforming ourselves to be like Jesus, even though we want to be like Jesus. We're like, I don't want that bad, right? To have to go through these horrible things. But then God puts these things in our lives because he's transforming us. And we only grow when we go through these difficult circumstances. Because you don't grow on the mountaintop. When you're on the mountaintop and everything's great, you're like, oh, this is awesome. You're chilling. When you're in the valley and you're struggling and going through difficult times and you're calling out to God, that's when you're growing spiritually. Right? And God puts us through that. You know, it's like a weight trainer. Some, somebody who works all those muscles out, what do they call that? Resistance training? There's got to be some resistance. Your muscles aren't going to get big sitting on the couch. You know what I'm saying? You're not gonna have biceps that look like Cliff back there. Cliff, flex a bicep for me. <laughs> You're not gonna have biceps that look like Cliff. If you don't work out, that resistance training is what God's doing with us because he's working in our lives and it's not pleasant. It's painful, but in the end, it develops character. And in the end, we become more like Jesus. So I'm just gonna end with this right here. And uh, you know, I don't, I don't know if we have time for a song or should I just go ahead and pray? Okay, so we're going to sing one, one more uh, one song to close out, and then we're dismissed. All right. All right. Amen. Uh -huh.